Isaiah chapter 40, verse, uh, verse 28, beginning of verse 28 through 31. Please share your word with someone. It's everyone to stand in the presence of the Lord. Amen. We want to always give reverence to God. If it stood from the Old Testament, giving reverence to God, and if the dignitary were to come in, we'd give reverence by standing. And because God is the Word, this is why we stand. Amen. Everyone stand. Waiting on you. Everyone stand. Reverence to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Please share the Word with somebody if they happen not to have the Word with them. Feel free for them to look on. Waiting everyone to stand, everyone stand, waiting on you. Everyone stand. Yes, let's give the Lord worship in this place. Hallelujah. We think about He's given us our members, our legs, our hands, our eyes. It's a beautiful thing to come into God's house and to worship Him in the beauty of holiness. Amen. Everybody see verse number 28. All right, follow along silently as I read the word aloud. Isaiah tells us, Has thou not known, has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. Talking about God. There is no searching of his understanding. Look at this. Verse 29, he giveth, continue action, giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord, mm, God, I thank you. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. First Peter chapter 3 verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for us, suffered for sins rather, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was repairing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure were to even baptism to also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who was gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Let's look to the Lord this afternoon. Dear Lord, in the name of Jesus, we come before your holy presence once again. Uh, we know, God, that you loved us so much that you gave your only begotten Son. And we stand in this holy place before you, the Holy One, behind this holy pulpit, God, asking that you would use us once again to bring a word, a round of word to our hearts. Fill us up and grant us your wisdom, your knowledge, your intellect. We praise, pray right now that your grace, God, will just be manifested through this word that we hear this afternoon. Uh, those that are in this congregation, Lord, we pray that their ears will be blessed, Lord, by this word that they hear. They will not only be a hearer of the word, but, Lord, they will be a doer of the word. We pray right now for those, God, that are not able to be with us and those that are listening, Lord, by the way of media. We pray, God, that they also, Lord, Lord, will be blessed, Lord, by this word that they hear. We pray that this word will transform some individual, that today, Lord, they might, uh, Lord, rise from the situation that they're in and that they might walk by faith and not by sight. I pray this word will do a work down on the inside of the hearts and the minds of many women. Young people today, God, 
your word is promised it shall not return to you void it will prosper in every soul that you send it to give us ears to hear right now we pray for our city Fort Wayne and we pray Lord for our, our state we pray for our nation God blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord and the people you have chosen for your own inheritance touch that someone today that hears this word will come to the understanding that they can be born again of the water and of the spirit they can repent of their sins and be baptized in Jesus name they can be filled with the Holy Ghost God I pray for the backslider those that have been discouraged and taken their eyes off you help them recover themselves God out of the trap of the adversary I pray right now that someone that hears this word will be saved someone God be encouraged or somebody be edified right now and will be careful to give your name all the glory all the honor and all the praise come on and say with me in Jesus name amen may be seen in the presence of the Lord amen praise the Lord let's give the Lord another hand praise for his goodness I'd like for you to look back in Isaiah chapter number 40 verse number 28 rather verse number 31 I'd like to lift the words from there it says they that wait they that wait now this wait is not talking about like you sitting on a park bench or waiting for the bus or waiting for your ride this wait is talking about service we say they that wait upon the Lord means those that serve the Lord shall renew their strength for topic for this afternoon I'd like to speak to your heart for a few minutes and say this with me serving, serving through, through suffering, suffering gives me, gives me strength. strength say that again serving, serving through, suffering through suffering gives me strength gives me strength here you know this is encouraging here when we look at as the Lord dealt with Isaiah because sometimes we have a mindset especially when we're younger that we can do anything and everything but the writer brings it in the proper context and slows on and says in verse 30 even the youth shall faint and be weary and young men that be sent off to war even the young men shall utterly fall but they that wait or serve the Lord shall renew their strength. Uh, praise be unto God. It has a way of being refreshed. You know, sometimes things have a way of getting stale. Now, God is never stale, but our perspective, the way we look at God, sometimes gets distorted. And just like you need to refresh your computer when you're on a page and it's like nothing's happening, you have to refresh that page. Sometimes we need to refresh our outlook and perspective of how we see God. Here, when, I, uh, when we look within the, the text here, I wanted to talk a little bit about this afternoon about uh, the strength that we get through serving the Lord and through suffering. Back here in the book of First Peter, Let's note here verse number 18. We find the example of Christ's suffering. It says, Christ once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened, that word quickened means made alive by the Spirit. There are three types of ways of suffering. You can suffer physically, you can have an ailment in your body, the Folks, a long time ago used to say, I got a misery. I got a misery in my shoulder. <laughs> Called the misery. I got, I got a misery in my back. <laughs> uh, you might have a pain in your knee. You might have a headache. Uh, suffering physically sometimes because there's a malfunction that takes place. It could take place because of an injury. It could take place because of some type of physical impairment. Uh, you could be born with some type of birth defect and have some type of physical uh, debilitating uh, deformity or something that takes place here. So sometimes phys uh, physical suffering comes about through these areas or sometimes even the devil himself has a way of inflicting pain upon our bodies. Uh, sometimes it comes, amen, through the adversary. Besides physical suffering, we could suffer also mentally. Um, we think about ways of suffering mentally, we talk about emotionally, 
When we look at this here, uh, sometimes our mental anguish could be even harder than our physical suffering. With a physical bruise, it'll heal after a while, but a mental type of suffering is with us sometimes for a lifetime. Sometimes the things that are said against us when we were younger, uh, those images, those remember words are images, they are formed in our mind. We find that we always have to combat against this type of suffering. Fear causes torment, a type of anguish. Remember, fear is not of God, right? The Bible said perfect love does what? Cast, Cast it out in all fear. Perfect love, complete love. Praise be unto God that God has complete love. When you go through a mind battle, amen, you're, you're faced mentally by what you see. You're faced mentally by what you hear, amen? Uh, anguish. Uh, we think about these type of spirits that take place. The apostles had to face that, didn't they? In the times where they lived and preached the word, they physically came up. I mean, people physically came against the apostles. Uh, you hear the phrase, if I could just wring that person's neck. Well, they physically wanted to wring the neck of the apostles. People, people physically in Jesus' time when he walked upon the earth, physically wanted to do, look at this, the Son of God harm. So we can't get away from suffering here. So there's, as we look at this here, physical mental. And then of course there's spiritual suffering. Suffering here, when we look at this, comes about in, during the time here uh, because of what's in our flesh dwells no good thing. Uh, we understand that we have what we call Adamic nature. That nature that comes from Adam. Fallen nature. We are affected by the lust or the desires of our eye. We're affected by the world, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh. In our flesh are certain traits and characteristics, all right, that rise up within us that we have to combat against. And we find here spiritual suffering is part also of the child of God. As we look at this, we have to understand here that spiritual suffering also can be inflicted by the devil. Amen. How many understand that when Jesus was in the wilderness? I mean, I understand, according to the word of God, he was tempted in all three areas. Talk to me this afternoon. The lust of the eye. Let's say that. The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. But praise be unto God, Jesus overcame all those areas of temptation. And it's very vital that he did that, that he can deliver you and I out of temptation. Amen. Let's give God some praise. Amen. Let's understand here, nobody can deliver you from something that's still in it. Right. Amen. Jesus came to save us from our sins. Praise the Lord. So in a body, he had to feel everything that we feel. He had to feel what rejection felt like. He had to feel like the hurt and the pain when he was lied on and talked about and ridiculed. And he went on to let us know here, and as we look at this, uh, I want you to understand that the perfect servant leader was Christ. Jesus Christ being the very issue of God, never deterred from the path that God had for him. He said, for this reason came I into the world to suffer, to die, and to rise again the third day. Amen. Yeah. He set the pattern for us. Therefore, nobody can really say before God, Lord, you don't know what I'm going through because Jesus, amen, God rather put himself in a body form. He understands, amen, what it is to go through. And uh, I'm so glad that he did this because he has already been able to put himself in a position that he can relate to us. But what we need to understand here, by doing the will and the work of God, we are able to relate to God. Amen. Let's look at this for a little bit here. When we look at suffering, and again, we go back to uh, 1 Peter here, chapter number 3 here, it goes on and talks about a word here, long suffering of God. And I thought this really stood out in my studying here, which sometimes were disobedient, but once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, you know, there was a time that God put up with the foolishness of men yeah. or mankind. There was a time that God... Uh, he was, the Bible said he would wink at man's disobedience, but now he's commanded all men everywhere to repent. 
There was a time here. Let's look at the long suffering. It says, once the long suffering, verse 20, of God waited in the days of Noah. Noah preached approximately about 120 years. One message is going to rain. Yes, Lord. He preached and he waited. He preached and he waited. He preached and he waited. He preached and he built. He preached and he built. Yes, yes. He preached and he built. He built the ark. Amen? Amen. And as the ark was coming into form, all right, there's no doubt that some that were looking at Noah must have looked at him as being a crazy old man yes, yes. building this ark, this boat, because remember, it never rained on the earth before. The way the vegetation got the water is that the mist came up from the ground. All right? People today, as we build the concept of salvation in their minds, which only comes through Jesus, no other form, no other person, no other identity, Jesus is the only Savior. He's not a Savior. He's the only way to God. Amen. Now, we build that conception of who God is by living a life of overcoming. So as Noah is building the ark here, in the mind of some individuals who don't have faith, look at him as being a crazy old man, building this for no purpose. But look at the word there in the text, long-suffering. I want you to think about this afternoon for a few minutes. Look how long God put up with our foolishness yeah. before we came to him. Thank you. Look how many times, amen, that God spoke to us. Uh, and we were in the wrong place doing the wrong thing. Thank you. And yet his word, like a penetrating laser, met us in darkness. Yeah. And said, you need to get saved. And he waited on us. Thank came to us the following week. You need to get saved. And he waited on us. We were busy drinking, smoking, getting high, doing our own thing. Chasing men, chasing women. And God waited. And God waited. And God waited. The long-suffering of God. Now that we've gotten saved, and sometimes we're not where we ought to be in the Lord, God is still long-suffering with us. God is very patient with us. See, God doesn't treat us like we would want to treat one another. You know, we get so short-tempered and we get so quick to judge. God said, I put up with individuals' foolishness because I'm not done working on them. You know, we want to get rid of others until it's our turn. And then it's like, wait a minute. You know, and again, I tell you, mercy is like money in the bank. No deposit, no return. But how many know that God is rich in mercy? See, it, it was, he was showing mercy when the ark was being built and gave him about 120 years to come on in the ark and get saved, right? Let's look at the text here. We find here that when some would look at even a failure in ministry, because it says here, preparing, preparing this ark here, it says, uh, that is, a few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Of course, the ark was able to, to occupy more individuals than just eight. The ark was not full. The only ones that were saved were, Moses, were Noah and his wife, the three sons, and their wives. So basically, you just have family in the ark. Yes, yes. But there was room in the ark, and you all talked to me this afternoon, the ark represents who? Jesus. Represents Jesus, amen? There was more room in the ark for souls to get saved but yet, only eight were obedient to the word of the Lord. Amen. Look at verse 21 here. Read this with me. It says, The like figure went to even baptism, doth also now save us. Now, many individuals try to say baptism has nothing to do with salvation. Many people are going to sleep quoting out of Romans uh, chapter 10. Just believe in your heart, confess in your mouth, and you shall be saved. And you take that scripture out of context. We find when we go back to the birthday of the church, the church started on the day of Pentecost, and they asked the question, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter did not say, Peter having the keys of the kingdom, did not say, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Peter said, repent 
and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. By water. Let's look at this here. The like figure were to even baptism to also now save us. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer. Look at this. The answer of a good conscience toward God. Can I take my time and go through this a little bit here? Let's look at this here. When we look at a good conscience toward God, remember your conscience is like a clean slate of paper. In other words, what you write on that paper ends up being what's part of your conscience. Yeah. When you think about conscience, you think about knowledge or to know, right? Yeah. To study, to have knowledge, to know. What, you, what is written in your mind ends up being part of your conscience. So therefore, if you're looking at worldly things or listening to worldly things, your conscience then ends up, amen, being tainted with a worldly mindset. We call that a carnal mind. Amen. We find here, as we look back at the text here, in order to have a good answer is toward God, you must, you must look at the text again correctly, God must be asking the question in order for man to give the answer. The answer of a man, a good conscience toward who? Toward God. Some individuals try to have a so-called good conscience and they compare man to man. That's not what the text is talking about here. It's talking about here having a good conscience toward God, which means here, because there's none righteous, no, not one. The Bible said all of us like sheep have gone what? Have gone astray. Every man has turned to his own ways. Therefore, in order to have a good conscience toward God, we've got to look at the work of Calvary. Yes, yes. It was his work, Christ Jesus on Calvary. Amen. He bared our sins in his body Amen. on Calvary. Amen. When he was beaten and whipped with the cat of nine tails, he bared that in his body. He did the work of God, look at this, by allowing himself to be in the place of suffering. There's no way you can be like God except you be in a place of suffering. Yeah. Amen. This means here what actually suffers is your flesh, not God. Your soul rejoices. Your soul rejoices to know that you put the old man down. The old man who never wants to believe God. The old man never wants to serve God. The old man that is nasty and filthy. The old man that does, does not want to take God at his word. Once you have put to death, or you, in other words here, the Bible talks about mortify, put to death the old man, the, old, the new man is renewed in knowledge. Let's look at this here. How do we have a good conscience toward God? It says here by the resurrection here, God has got to write a new story, amen, in the textbook of our mind. Yes. God has got to write something on that clean piece of paper, uh, and before he does that, God does not write good over bad. God has got to clean your soul before he can pour in his presence. Yes. God has got to clean up your mind before you can come to him. Yes. How many know God does not receive junk? Amen. 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 Look at this here. There's always a process. In the Old Testament, you didn't just run up into the Holy of Holies. First of all, only the high priest went beyond the veil. You never came to God without what? Sacrifice. sacrifice. Everybody say this. Sacrifice. sacrifice. Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy Accepting with God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Look at that. This means here you've got to have a new mind. Where do you get your mind from? The Word of God. Amen? But the sacrifice is the part that you do. Presenting your body a living sacrifice here. goes on to let us know here that Jesus Christ, look at verse 22, is going to heaven. And here it says the right hand of God. Now, let, let me give you a better understanding here. 
there are not three persons in heaven. Amen. That term right hand, all right, is figuratively. It's not talking about an image that you see the Father, and then to the right hand of the Father, there's a son. When you look into the Godhead, you only find one person. You find Jesus. Jesus is the only visible representation of an invisible God. Amen. Say that with me. Jesus, Jesus is the only visible, the only visible representation, representation of an invisible God. An invisible God. So for, uh, in other words, this is why the Lord said that when you see me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. Amen? So right hand has got to be something not about geographics here. It has to do with power and authority. So look at verse number 22. Angels and authorities and powers. What does it say? Being made subject unto him. When Jesus rose with all power in heaven and earth, he said, all power is invested in me. Now, if Jesus has all power, then let me ask you here. Then what about the power of God? If Jesus has all power, then what do you do with the Father? Where did you get our power from? Come on, talk to me. Where did you get our power from? Who had to place him as Lord of creation? His Father did, right? Yeah. So therefore, uh, since all of us are human beings, we have to be able to identify with another human. Yes, yes. So Jesus Christ ends up being not like you and I because of the Immaculate Conception. He is the grace of God. He is the anointing of God. He's the very issue of God. He is God invisible, made visible. And the suffering that he went through was in his body. I'll go as far as say the suffering that he went through was also emotionally. We know when he came to the tomb of Mary and Martha, uh, or Lazarus rather, he talks to Mary and Martha, and the Bible says he groaned within himself. And that, how many know here that we serve a God that feels about what we're going through? God is never indifferent about your situation. You may talk to people and call people on the phone, and they're like, well, yeah, you know, they, 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 they may not be able to connect with you. But Jesus is always able to relate to your situation. Let's give God some praise. Amen? So he feels, we have a high priest that is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. So therefore, and we've got to tie in chapter number four here. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. See, as a believer, you've got to realize Jesus went through and I've got to prepare or arm my mind that I also got to go through. The benefit here is that as a mind suffering in the flesh, look at verse number one here, First Peter chapter four, verse one. When I suffer and tell my old man he's not going to control me, I'm not going to let anger control me. I'm not going to let disappointment control me. I'm not going to let resentment control me. But I'm going to let the Holy Ghost rule my human spirit. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. See, your suffering is in your flesh. The old man doesn't want to do what God would have uh, him to do. Amen. That's why your old man is not your friend. Your old nature is not your friend. Right. Amen. Amen. How is it that you can be doing good and then you get off track? It's because in our flesh dwells no good thing. No good thing. So our service unto the Lord has got to be by our new man and with our new man. Which means the new man has got to get power and anointing in the presence of God to carry out the will of God. Amen. Look at that. Cease from sin. The world will try to make you think you cannot live above sin. Once a drinker, always a drinker. Once a fornicator, always a fornicator. Once an adulterator, always an adulterator. The devil is a liar. Because my Bible tells me if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He's a new creator. He's a new creation. Amen? How many believe the word? When you are born again the way the Bible says here, and the power of God is working through you, God gives you power not to sin. How many understand your sin is actually a choice? Nobody made you lie. Nobody made you steal. Nobody made you get high. 
Nobody made you say a four-letter word. Nobody made you do anything. You did it because it was in your flesh. You did it because you didn't want the word of God to confine you and to cut you. So understand this here. My topic this afternoon is serving a man through suffering gives me strength here. There's got to be something that as I serve God, suffering the word of God, amen, like she is, cuts off flesh. And God cuts off things that are not like him. Let's go back. Let's look at this here. I want you to understand also the purpose of suffering. We talk about three types of suffering. What do we say they were? How do we suffer? Physically? Mentally? Mentally and spiritually, right? Let's, go, let's look now here at the purpose of suffering. Because Some people will look at this, and I'm concerned about the times we're living in. And today, uh, this, uh, a lot of people want to preach the gospel without suffering, and that's not the gospel. Amen. We live in a generation that people just don't want to do without anything. Yeah. They want immediate gratification. Hello, talk to me. Amen. They want a quick fix. It's not like that. Let me tell you something here. There were no shortcuts to God glorifying himself in Christ Jesus. Jesus had to go by the way of suffering. What did, what did Jesus want the most? He wanted people to believe in him. So the devil comes to him, temptation, it is written. Throw yourself off this mountain, and it is written. The angels that take you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. The devil tried to tempt Jesus and make it feel like, hey, you can get exactly what you want. You can get people to believe in you. But Jesus is not a sideshow. Amen. 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 Because see, what that's moving into, that moves into the arena of witchcraft. It moves into the arena where people want signs. And if signs were to save people, Israel would have never been lost. But when it comes to being like God, there are no shortcuts to God's glory. Jesus had a role and stature and wisdom and knowledge. So therefore, he does not allow himself to be obedient to the spirit of the devil. And look here, when you suffer and going through, sin always seems to make sense. Three areas of temptation. If you're hungry, turn these stones into bread. Jesus had the ability to make things happen. We don't have any money? Hey, you got to make some money. It won't be lawful. Go out and sell some dope. Amen? Amen. Transport some items. Amen. You can be poor in the morning and rich in the evening. But you won't have a good answer toward God. You won't have a clean conscience toward God. Amen? Let's look at this here. So when it comes to serving the Lord here, I've got to understand, you've got to understand here, there's got to be a purpose or reason in suffering. The purpose of suffering here, even though it may be painful, you know, emotionally and spiritually, let's look what God wants to do here. We find here that God allows a child of God to suffer, for, for point number one, is to produce fruit. We all know that the fruit of the Spirit if we go back to the Galatians, we're not going to read through that, but the love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Number one, God is trying to get something out of your life, so he allows you to suffer because he desires to produce fruit in your life. That's point number one. The reason for suffering is to produce what? Produce fruit. You can look at this really twofold in a sense here because fruit is not just, it's got to be number one, the fruit of the Spirit, but also offer your life other individuals have got to imitate the walk that you're walking. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. This means individuals have got to see God in you, and therefore there's got to be a pattern that you set for them. Amen. And by individuals following you as you follow the Lord, they become your fruit. So we use the term fathers in the Lord. Fathers in the Lord means there's got to be some children in the Lord. Mothers in the Lord means there's got to be some children in the Lord of the Lord. Amen? Ask yourself, who's getting saved off of my life? Ask yourself, who can see Jesus in me? Can they see Jesus in my walk? Can they see Jesus in my talk? Am I excited about the Lord? You gotta have some fruit, amen? amen? The Lord said if we don't bear fruit, He said, I'll I'll, I'll pluck you up and I'll cast you away, amen? amen? 
So therefore, let's look at this here. The suffering has to do also with pruning. You might want to write that down. The word of God cuts us, cuts the old man. So the devil says, oh, I'm mad, I don't want to curse. So the Holy Ghost says, shut your mouth, don't let that four-letter word jump out. And how I many of you know sometimes we're not in the right place, we use the truth to hurt people. Amen. Amen. And that's ungodly. So number one here, the purpose of suffering is to produce fruit. Number two, the purpose of suffering is to shut the mouth of the devil. Amen. In other words here, when we look at this here, Satan accuses you and says, that young person is not going to live for God because they can't go out and get them some. Oh, that man or woman of God only serves God. Amen. Because God's blessing them with things. Yes, yes. So God says here, I'll show you what suffering is all about. I got a man who's righteous, that's upright, and his name is Job. And he's blessed because he's doing the godly thing. Right. And then, so of course he's blessed. Of course he's going to serve you. You got him hedged in. You got all the blessings around him. So that's okay. I'll take the hedge away from him. And I'll let you try him. I'll let you test him. Because I know what's in him. This man is not going to fail his faith toward me. Yeah. This man is going to walk. We talked about this word in Sunday school. This man is going to have integrity. And I told you integrity is doing the right thing when nobody else is looking at you. Thank you Jesus. So the Lord allows Satan to try him. And he tests Job. His children die. He loses his cattle. Things start to burn down. All, I mean, one right after another, uh, you might say the gates of hell would just open up on Job. How would you react if the Lord allowed a loved one to be called home? Lord, why did that happen to me? I wasn't doing anything. Why did you call my loved one home? You could have prevented it. But we, don't, we find here that Job knows that God's up to something. Let me tell you something. When you're suffering going through, you've got to have faith and integrity, God. You've got to know, hey, God's up to something. Right. If, I can, if I can use the word hell, with all the hell going on in your life, now, I don't mean that cursing because the Bible said the, hell, the gates of hell should not prevail. Right. Amen. Amen. This means we are up against the gates of hell. Right. Upon this rock, I will build my church. You quote the word with me. And the gates of a hell should not prevail. See, when you feel hell coming against you, it is not to destroy you. Amen. Some of you should have got happy off of that. Amen. Let's give God some praise for that. Look at here. I said the silence the devil here because the devil accuses the children of God day and night. Of course you're going to bless him. He's got a wife. Of course you're going to bless him. You know, she got a husband. But what happens when you start to get some losses in your life? What happens when you lose your job? What happens when love one walks out on you? And he wasn't asking for that. Amen. You went to church every day and you prayed and you fasted and you're hoping that loved one got saved, but instead of coming to church, they went out the back door. Instead of appreciating you, they depreciated you. Some losses. And then look, the one that's left there, Job's wife, is no help. Why don't you just curse God and die? In other words, you're such a pitiful sight. I don't want to look at you. Let's just stop everybody's misery. Just curse God and die. We can be done with everything. Yes, yes. Look here. We'll go back to this here. I said part two is to shut the devil's mouth. When you're suffering going through and your flesh could do wrong, and yet you don't, you prove the devil to be the liar that he is. Because the devil is saying young people cannot live saved unless they go out and fornicate. Amen. Middle-aged people can't live saved unless they go out and, 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 and play the field. Amen. Amen. So since the devil is accusing you before God day and night, the Bible says they overcame them by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. you got to have a testimony already within your own spirit. Yes. When nobody else is around, i got to know that God is doing a work in me. Yes. Let's look at this here. Everybody say this with me. Serving through suffering. Serving through suffering. Everybody ain't saying it. Serving through suffering gives me strength. Hallelujah. 
in the midst of suffering is when you find out who your God really is. You find him to be the God in the wilderness. And where are you? In the wilderness. You find him to be the God in confusion. Why is this happening to me? He's the God to show up when your mind is confused. He's the God to show up in the wilderness. Amen. He's the God to show up in misery and in sorrow and in heartache and pain and loneliness. He's the God that shows up for you. Because what kind of God would he be if he didn't show up for you? How I many know that God is always faithful? And many times God said, I was just ready to come to you, but before I came to you, he started murmuring and complaining. And look, your murmuring and complaining to me, your murmuring and complaining made me back off of you. Because God says, I don't want to be around people that murmur and complain. I want nothing to do with people like that. The Lord said, remember your forefathers, I allowed them to die in the wilderness because they murmured and complained. They didn't believe me in the wilderness. And I had to raise up a new generation, a Joshua generation, that's going to believe me for the land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to ask you a question there. Is there anybody that still believes God? Is there anybody here that still believes all the word? Amen? Is there anybody that still believes that it's worth serving the Lord no matter what you're going through? No matter what losses you encounter? So look at Job's story here. And I'm, I'm going to get on this point and get off of this point here. In the midst of suffering and when Job's wife said, why don't you just curse God die? He said, you talk like a foolish woman. Naked came I into the world. I was born naked. And if I got to leave naked. I was born naked, but I got some riches. And I'm rich and wealthy. And then God took the hedge off and let the devil try me. And now I'm a pauper. Now I'm poor. But Job knew, even though I may not be rich according to man's standards. I'm rich in wealth. I'm rich in faith. And I'm wiser in God now because I'm questioning about what God is doing in my life. Suffering allows you to get to a place where you take internal inspection about who you are, where you're going, and what you really want to do with your life. Sometimes I talk to people and they, they say, well, I want to do this, I want to do that. And I don't find God in their conversation. And my question is, where is God in all this? You want to be successful? Where is God? You want to be wealthy? Where is God? I want a husband, I want a wife. But where is God in all that? It ought to be, I want a godly man. I want a godly wife. Amen. I want godly children. Come on, somebody. I, I want to work for a company or I want to be CEO of a company that God wants me to be part of. See, see, God's got to be in the conversation. Amen? Come on, somebody. God's got to be in it. If God is not in everything you do, then your life is empty. It's void. And Job knew here, even though things were taken away from me, Job knew I'm just as rich now than I was before, not monetarily, but in faith. And then he has those so-called friends, Job. You must have did something wrong. Ain't nobody in the world that gone through everything you're going through. You must have some sin in your life. And how quick do you want to judge people that are going through? See, they need to repent of their sins. The reason why they're not being blessed. Wait a minute, you're not their God. And be careful how you put judgment out because the same judgment you put out is coming to you again. And they may be, they may be crying today, but you might be crying next week. Don't be quick to judge somebody. So Job's so-called friends, you must have done something wrong. They're just staring and looking at him. Come on, Job. Fess up. Come on, Job. Trust me, but I'm looking inside of myself, and I don't see any reason why I'm going through all this. I lost my children. I lost my money. The wife is here saying, curse God and die. Right? And Lord, why didn't you take her? She ain't no help to me. Some days we want God to take out of our life. Hello? Hello, somebody. Sometimes God leaves people there, and those are people there that are going to turn you the wrong way. You can't listen to them. If Job would have listened to her, he might have cursed God and died. But Job said, I'm going to hold on to my faith. And then the Lord said, Job, I'm going to do something for you, because in the end, I'm going to bless you, but Job, I'm not going to bless you until you pray for those so-called friends. 
And after Job, everybody say after. After Job prayed for those so-called fair-weathered friends. After Job prayed for them, God turned his captivity around and gave him double for his trouble. He got more children and more wealth, but it wasn't until he prayed for them. So Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for those that despitefully use you and persecute you. Say all men of evil against you falsely. Look, your enemies are somebody you can identify with. Amen. Amen. Your enemy is somebody that's, that's, that, that they got the gun pointed toward you. The enemy is the one that's talking about you, not just behind your back, but in your face. They talk loud to make sure you're here. Amen. <laughs> God, I think we said it this, this morning in Sunday school class, the Lord said, a man's ways please the Lord, I'll make you even your enemies to be your footstool, right? Or be at peace with you. Let's look at this here. The other point here, as we look at part, uh, the third part here, I said to produce fruit, to silence the devil. The third one is to glorify God. Hallelujah. Serving through suffering gives you strength because it's after you go through your suffering. Yes. After you go through your suffering, God gets glorified. Yes. After Jesus went through the lust of the eye, the lust of flesh, and the pride of life, the temptation in the wilderness, it was just preparing for his ministry. How many know here that he comes to John the Baptist and John says, Behold the Lamb of God is taking away the sins of the world. But he had to be tried first in order to do ministry. See, God wants to try you first so that you know what you talk about when you go out and tell somebody about the goodness of the Lord. Because the world looks at you and says, well, you church people, you got everything made for you. They don't know your whole story. Because church people go through. Amen. 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 Come on, somebody. Church people go through.